Coming up next on Lakeshore Focus, we have one of the strongest leaders in our region, a woman who has made a huge impact in many, many ways. Stay with us and find out who I'm talking about. Welcome again to Lakeshore Focus, a weekly show highlighting the key issues, important events, and interesting people in our region. I'm Keith Kirkpatrick. My opening remark should have made you wonder who's going to be on the show today, a woman who has made a huge impact on our region in many, many ways. I was telling the truth. Our guest has been a predominant leader on issues of workforce, education, economic development, and more. She is someone I admire and is respected by so many for the imprint she has left on Northwest Indiana and way beyond. Let's welcome Linda Wallace-Shansky, who is the President and CEO for the Center of Workforce Innovation. I probably shouldn't say you've been here forever, but you sure have made an impact on this region. But you have been here your whole life, right? I have been here my whole life. You know, I was born in, in um, East Chicago, Indiana, and lived in Gary, Hammond, Maryville, Crown Point, and now in Ogden Dunes, so certainly I have been around. Uh, went away for a brief stint when I was um, at Bloomington, Indiana, while I was at, at IU, um, but returned here and have been pretty happy since. You know, Linda, I, I, in my introduction, I know I was a little flowery, but it really is true. Yeah. I mean, you are really one of the most important leaders in our region. I mean, do you see yourself that way? Well, you know, Thank you for the accolades, but no, I am a, a member of this community that cares about the community, doing the best work I know how to, just like so many other people in Northwest Indiana who are all contributing in different ways to, you know, the growth and prosperity here. Yeah, but you really care. I mean, <laughs> there, your care is really deep. Why do you care about this region so well, much? You know, I do care. I'm pretty passionate. And, um, you no, know, you're I, very passionate about this well, region. <laughs> I, I, you know, really believe in uh, this community and this community as a whole, as a region, has um, so much um, potential. It has great assets. It's got re great resources, yet it does have challenges as well. And I see many of these challenges um, being overcome, at least um, in the rest of my lifetime, and more so in the future. So you can get really excited when you know that ultimately a difference can be made. And when you look at that, and you look at the fact that I, I do have children here now, and grandchildren, you know, I want this place to be um, really as best as it can be, as good as it can be um, for that future generation. You, you know, the, do you feel like, what has been maybe for you the most significant impact you felt you have made here? Well, I, I feel... That's usually a question at the last of the show, yeah. but I'm going to ask it early. Well, you know, I, I feel that I, that I have been kind of blessed to be given opportunities to make a difference. And at least also having the, um, the foresight to know when those opportunities have presented um, themselves so that I could take advantage of them and, and can contribute. And, and probably the, the work that I've done in workforce development um, may be one or the area that has made the biggest difference in the lives of quite a few people in Northwest Indiana and also a lot of employers. You know, many people don't see, you know, what we do at the center, what goes on with Work One or previously Kankakee Valley. They don't see all the things that occur behind the scenes um, to make things happen. And, and I guess that's where I've done uh, my best work, oftentimes behind the scenes to make a difference. Well, you've been the driving force really behind all the issues in workforce in this region for a long time. Um, I know you've shared this with me before, but help me recount a little bit. How'd you get in this? Because people are always interested in kind of how careers start. And you, yeah. this really has been a significant career for you. I mean, you've kind of been in the same field the whole time, which well, is probably what's made you yeah. very effective at what you're yeah. part of what's made you yeah, effective. Yeah, almost the whole time. You know, I actually started out in the steel industry. And so I have great respect for steel and my I'm family. I'm trying to imagine you with boots on, but... Yeah, I didn't get that okay, far. That you know, that far. at okay. that time, um, 
that wasn't very uh, available to uh, young women. Oh, so, okay. um, so, but in my family was all in the steel industry, and so I have great respect for the steel industry. However, when I was there, and I was there for uh, four summers um, and a little bit after college, I realized that that was not going to be, um, you know, my passion. And so I, you know, thought about what I wanted to do, and you know, my values were such that I wanted to contribute to society in a different way. So I began working uh, kind of in, in what you might consider an HR role, so to speak, with workforce development as a caseworker helping young women actually uh, find employment uh, who were on um, assistance, temporary assistance for needy families, um, then moved on to be a career counselor, and then have moved um, through different uh, um, roles in the career path to get where I am today. So um, it has been a journey, it has been a passion. I have considered other occupations. I've been offered other jobs in other industries along the way. And uh, after a lot of reflection, just decided to stay in this field because of the impact it has on people and the relationship it has with so many different um, parts of our society, whether it's businesses, economic development, education, uh, public policy. Um, so it, it has an opportunity to allow me and uh, the, the, the work to also influence other uh, facets of life. You know, it's interesting because you and I have had many conversations before, and it never occurred to me until you were talking about that. You know, the, my first career was in was in career counseling. I mean, that was kind of the first thing I was doing out of out of grad school was doing okay. career counseling. So it's kind of fascinating. Yeah, I but, didn't know that. But for you, it's incredible. You, which came first, your passion for what you were doing, or did you grow into loving what you were doing? You know, I believe I grew into loving what I was doing. I, I thought that this would be of interest, um, but over time certainly found that passion um, for, the, for the work. Uh, so it wasn't immediate. I didn't have this as part of my career plan. In fact, um, didn't really have much of a career plan other than... Um, have a job. You know, get, yeah, get my degree, have a job. Thought it would be in human resource type work. But other than that, wasn't certain where all that would lead to. And certainly that is how a lot of um, careers start. And um, what we need to do today, you, you know, you've heard me speak about this before, is we need to make sure that young people, as they're thinking of their future, you know, can have a career plan if, if at all possible, but as they keep moving through life, develop transferable skills so that they can move in a lot of different directions and have that self-awareness about themselves, you know, to take them in those different directions if that's what they decide to do. Because we don't always have people around us that can guide us or be our mentors, and so sometimes we have to navigate all this ourselves, and let's face it, that's how life is. Why, you really why, have to take responsibility for yourself. Why has that become so important to you? Because, I mean, you work with all aspects of, of workforce, you know, people who are laid off, people who are looking for jobs, people who are transitioning their careers late in life, all kinds of things. But you've always had a pretty strong focus about young people. Why is that so important? You know, because I see that they are the, uh, the future of uh, society, they are our future, and that if you can get a stable beginning, if you can have that stable future, if you can have you know, solid roots and, and develop those life skills and foundational skills and, and then work skills, that once again, no matter what's thrown at you, you'll be able to cope with it. I see so many people and have over my um, experiences that um, end up in positions that they really don't like their entire lives and that, um, uh, you know, can't figure out what to do if they lose a job and are just so devastated for so long that it, that it, it, they're paralyzed and it causes great dysfunction in their family. And so I always think that if, in fact, you know, we can better prepare our youth, their lives will be, be will all be better. They, they will have, you know, more control over what happens to them in, in their future. And it gets really exciting when you see youth, um, you know, have that light bulb turn on and you can see all of those uh, skills and competencies coming together and you know they're going to be fine. It seems like there's two aspects to this. One is kind of that 
aimless career, that kind of lost in the career path yeah. that you just spoke of. And then when people get to be 25, 30, whatever years old, they still are lost. And that really is damaging that future workforce. The other is those who just don't get the preparation. I mean, just don't learn the basic skills, the basic habits mm -hmm. real early on. What's our result then in our communities when you've got someone who now turns 24, 25 and they just haven't got that foundation there? Well, you know, it's, it's uh, some of the things that we experience as a society that folks go through and ra rather than being contributors, they are the, the takers and the receivers of all of the um, the, the opportunities that are out there. They, um, you know, fall into um, problems with um, first not being able to get a job, not being able to keep a job, um, not having any resources to rely on, but more so they have difficulties with drug problems, they have difficulties with um, family relationships, they have uh, mental health issues. I mean, all the things that we hope to avoid for ourselves and our children um, end up being carried by these young people who um, are not able to get a good start and a good beginning by the age of 24. So we've really got to help young people get a, a good start. You and I have had a conversation a couple of times, you know, kind of giving the enormity sometimes of the issues that face our region. And I've heard you say a couple of times, if we could just take and focus on a laser focus on one thing and really make a difference with one thing, push all of our resources toward that, maybe that's a strategy we need to embark upon. I've heard you say that you and I have had this conversation, right? Mm -hmm. I'm not, so we never reach a conclusion, but I'm curious at this point in time, if you could do that laser focus, what would be that one thing that you would say, let's put all of our resources toward that specific item? What would you do? Well, actually, I can't limit it to one. See, so, that's always um, the problem, That right? is always we the problem. We can't figure this out. Cannot limit it to one. So, you know, on, on one side of the equation, I would focus um, our, our resources on college and career readiness. So basically, it's making sure the young people have that foundation and that they have um, skills that they can use throughout their whole life, which it includes the life skills, the basic foundational skills, the work ethics, work readiness skills, and some tangible skill that they can use on the job, which could require, you know, a four-year education, a um, year certification or license, or a doctorate degree. So it can, it, you know, covers the vast gamut of, of educational opportunities. So that would be one thing. But before I move on, I would also focus on, you know, that also starts in pre-K. So it starts from very early, you know, on to close to adulthood. So, so you're still not going to be able to come up with one, right? You're going to come up with several we have to do. Well, the, you know, that's a big bucket. And so right. I, would, I w will stick with that particular bucket. Um, and the, uh, on the other side of the equation, I would say um, being able to advance our economy and taking a look at what are the um, employers, who are the employers that are able to stay, to locate here and stay here and grow here that can provide great job opportunities for people, which includes either a career path or high wage, high demand jobs so that people when when they have really proven themselves with the right foundation skill sets that they can make a living wage and and that then affords folks an opportunity to um, kind of advance in their their lives uh, provide for their families take advantage of um, opportunities that are out there whether they're that's good vacations or you know, it's opportunities to explore parks. It gives the community the ability to provide those resources to make sure those amenities are here and that great quality of life is here. And, um, you know, you can see those two buckets are huge and are important and that's why I can't decide on one. So we're going to still have this conversation into the future, I few guess. More some, some, some few point. more years. Few more years, yeah. Before the show, you and I were talking about, you know, how some people just kind of give up on, on the region. And you never seem to give up on this place. You just seem to keep going and going and having hope. What, why is that? When other people leave or give up, yeah. 
You never do. Well, you know, it's a combination of two things. First, you know, I do have a vision for this region, and, and you know, I believe it is um, attainable. And so I so think tell us the vision. Well, the vision is pretty much what I just talked about, and having this community that is a vibrant, fully vibrant community. Not to say it's not vibrant now. We have, as I said, very many things that are working towards favor that oftentimes we just don't appreciate. But you know, having said that, a more vibrant community, and I see that, and I, I believe that it can and is happening and so I want to be part of that I want to continue to make that contribution and I I do get excited about that and you know also the other thing that I really see that maybe other people don't see is the level of, of cooperation that's occurring all the fantastic things that actually are happening that once again because the busyness of our day-to-day -day lives we don't stop and reflect on and we don't really acknowledge are happening that are kind of huge advancements from where we were 10 years ago and the fact that people are willing to cooperate different you know uh, local economic development organizations education institutions elected officials municipalities you see so much more of that cooperation than that that reinforces that this aspiration can be achieved you talk about the evolution of things and you know, if I've been here nearly 30 years, and if I look back to that, that period of time, I remember how few women were in leadership roles then. And if you, I mean, if you really look around the landscape of things, there were just very few. You are one of those who've kind of always been in that role and as one of the prominent leaders as a woman in this region. How have you kind of seen that evolution for the rest of the female population here? And have, how have you seen that change? Well, I have seen so many more women being invited to the table or finding a place at the table um, so their voices can be heard and they can be an equal player um, in this marketplace. And so I would say that there is a, a great difference from 20 years ago and it's a very positive difference because actually, as you know, if you if you look around the region, you will see so many more leaders in uh, that are, are female in roles, whether they're mayors, or their commissioners, or their um, heading up co uh, companies, or they're running nonprofits, or so. How did it feel when you were the only girl at the table? And I've seen that. Yeah, I've yeah. seen a number of times when it was all the boys and Linda Walashansky sitting at the table. How'd you deal with that? Well, it was a, a little lonely, but by <laughs> the same token, um, you know, I I felt that it was an advantage being there so I just focused on that opportunity that I had to be there and um, just kept moving forward trying to get other women at the table as well but um, once again um, you know speaking my mind and um, also trying to understand the um, the male point of view on everything and looking at how I could uh, respond to that and take advantage of where they were sitting. Did you ever feel like you were a pioneer or sitting there when it was just you, maybe one other woman and, you know, 30 guys? They're like, man, I, I got some responsibility here. or I'm, There's a lot of pressure on me to do this better than other people. I mean, did you ever, those thoughts go through your head? Well, you know, I felt like I had a responsibility and that I needed to do a good job. And that's the way I've approached everything in my life. I, I really need to do the best job every day that I possibly can. Um, so that's the way I approached it. I certainly did not put a lot of emphasis on the fact that I was the only woman at the table or I did not think of myself as a pioneer. Now, looking back as you bring this to my attention, uh, maybe I was a pioneer then I just didn't realize it. but. Um, you know, I think it's just more important, once again, to, um, you know, ad advance your cause um, and do your best job rather than thinking about what your status is or what your specific role is. How, how does it feel to you when, and, and I, know, I know this happens to you, when somebody says, we need to find out what Linda thinks about this, which means that they're really listening carefully to what you have to say because what you're saying is real important. How does that feel when it feels like everybody's turning and going, yeah, yeah. so what does Linda have to say about yeah. this? Well, I, I do feel a little pressure because once again, if, there are, if they are coming to me for advice, I want to make sure that 
um, I take that role seriously and I, I give them um, uh, the best advice I possibly can. So, um, but it, once again, it's also a, um, a, a great honor to be able to do that and I feel very humbled. So, can you talk about a time where you felt maybe that you just really missed an opportunity or you just really kind of blew it some way? You know, because I mean, I'm, I'm painting this picture like, you know, you're the queen of the region here or something, but yeah. you know, we all have those, those moments where like, oh man, I just didn't handle that well. Can you think of one of those? Where you're like, man, I wish I would have just done that differently. You mean, you just want one example? <laughs> <laughs> sure, pick, pick your most glaring one, no. <laughs> Well, I just think it's important because you learn. We learn from mistakes. Maybe that's a better way to frame it. Yeah. Where did you learn from a mistake? Yeah. Well, you know, I, I can think back at an opportunity a number of years ago where I mean, this was about pulling the region together, um, but first having to work with um, the Department of Workforce Development in order to get a a proposal through to them on behalf of uh, the region. And in retrospect. I realized that um, while I should have participated in that process and I should have uh, taken a role of being behind the scenes with the um, officials at the Department of Workforce Development and instead used a different leader who was not as close to them as I was to kind of advance that proposal forward. So oftentimes you ha you know I I have to know when to lead and when to follow. And I think that's really important and that's sometimes where I've made my my uh, missteps or or blunders in calculating that. In each situation I I do look at very strategically on you know how does this need to be played out for the betterment of the cause I'm behind. That is a And and sometimes a, my judgment is wrong. So that's hard to believe. <laughs> but we'll, we'll leave it at that. So, Linda, we're, we're the last little few moments of the show. Just, if, you, if there was one message you wish everybody in this region would hear, what would that message be? Well, you know, I'm going to be, go back to the youth issue because you're okay. right that I do have a passion for youth. And, you know, it has to be about youth and giving young people an opportunity for employment, whether it's summer youth experience, experience during the summer and a, and a part time job in the summer or during the year. Employers and our community at large need to make those opportunities available because there are so many youth that are not getting a chance to work. Um, the unemployment rate for youth has gone from um, you know, um, in, in, ha, has gone sky high and was um, more significant during the recession than, than any of the adult populations. And these days, only about 30% of youth have a summer youth work experiences for, versus, you know, 46% uh, percent a decade ago. So there's less opportunity for them. And that's where they get many of their foundational skills. Well, you know, this is near and dear to my heart. So I appreciate you making that plug. And I appreciate everything you've done in this region. Well, and I mostly appreciate you came on the show. So. Well, thank you, Keith. It was a pleasure being here and, and I, I appreciate the opportunity. All right, thanks, Linda. Uh -huh. There's a cute anecdote that we sometimes hear in our families. Be nice to your children. Someday they will be taking care of you. I think we can broaden it and say, be nice to young people. Someday they will be taking care of you and serving you and carrying the burden of taxes and running things. In other words, our future is in their hands. Actually, this perspective is pretty selfish. We should want what's best for our young because they deserve it. One of the most important tenets of future prosperity is the ability and opportunity to earn to make enough to provide shelter, food, clothing, and health for you and your family. Let's expand that to have enough funds to get an education and enjoy life a bit. We know with an additional classes, training, degrees, and credentials, a person can earn the money needed to have the basics and then some. But don't we want people to thrive, not just survive? Thriving means that one has the resources to save some money for tough times, put back the needed dollars for retirement, donate to favorite charities, shower people with gifts, help someone in need, and take a vacation that is a long-lasting memory. There are two essential components for people to thrive. As I mentioned, opportunity and ability, meaning jobs and workers. 
In this region, we have constantly strived to grow and attract jobs. We know that young adults want to be in a place where employment is interesting and challenging while offering good, if not great, compensation. Most of us think there is little we can do to assist with this task, but supporting your local homegrown businesses is something we all can do. The second piece of our formula is to have a supply of capable, motivated, hardworking people who are ready to work. All of us can help there too. Work skills are mostly learned on the job. We can teach them in school, but they must be practiced. Every time a young person gets a chance to work, they can grow their abilities, providing them with opportunities to earn, whether that's part-time, temporary, project-based, or regular hours, will help their confidence, discover new skills, reinforce good habits, and they learn from their mistakes. We can offer them work and encourage others to do the same. Let's be selfish again for a moment and think. If I want someone to show up on time, treat me well, and empty my bedpan, I had better give them an opportunity to learn the basics now. We appreciate every time you turn on Lakeshore PBS and watch one of our shows. Your comments about any of our interviews on Lakeshore Focus are helpful to us. You can send your thoughts to us through the website or via email, both listed on your screen right now. If you can't find a previously aired show on our website for some reason, go to YouTube, type Lakeshore Focus and perhaps the name of the guest or topic you want to watch and ta-da, there it is. Be sure and join us again next week for another Lakeshore Focus. Until then, I'm Keith Kirkpatrick saying, make a positive difference in our world today.